Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report for Hour 3 on Wednesday, the 25th of July, and we have two remarkable guests. We have Dr. Bob Teal, Ph.D., the uh, nutrition, uh, one of the top nutritional wellness doctors in California and America, and we have uh, Tim Alexander with a breaking news story, and they all tie together. The two main subjects we're going to talk about today would be the weather problems and droughts and the issue of Syria. I want to hear first from uh, Tim Alexander to summarize what he said just before the break, and then hear a response from Dr. Bob in terms of how this is working out prophetically, because I believe we are on the verge of uh, either resolution to the situation, which will probably be a toxic peace treaty, or a very messy war with the closure of the Strait of Hormuz, with a uh, with a very very rapidly expanding transnational war between Sunni and Shiite Muslims, and Israel right on the cutting edge, literally of of pulling back from doing an attack after the announcement yesterday of the chemical weapons issues, which Bashir Assad says he has full control of. Tell us the story, uh, Tim, because this yeah, is important. Yeah. People kind of grasp that this is behind the news. They're not going to hear the regular snooze tainment, and it gives them analysis as well, to how it ties in with the Bible. One of, uh, one of the, the source material for this was Deepka, and Deepka has taken it down from, uh, of course, I had linked it on uh, from my blog, Europe. I've linked it, and uh, the link is still good, but if you go to their home site, that article they've taken down. Uh, okay, World War Three was averted uh, late yesterday at the last minute by the actions of the Israeli Chief of Staff, Lieutenant General uh, Benny Gantz. Here's what happened. Uh, the last several days, there's been this extraordinary uh, wave of publicity and comments by senior people. I'm speaking of uh, uh, President Obama, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. We still there? Yes, we are. I think we may have lost our connection with Dr. Bob. Yeah. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, by by uh, Hillary Clinton, by the President of Israel, Paris, by the Prime Minister Netanyahu, and the Defense Minister, former Prime Minister Barack, uh, all speaking about the chemical warheads. Uh, if they're transferred to Hezbollah, they'll attack. If it looks like they're going to be transferred to Hezbollah, they'll attack, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Yeah, in other words, and, and so and this is what basically Israel was getting ready to do a preemptive attack on, yeah. on chemical Yesterday, and biological weapons uh, depots. Iran obviously picked up on this. Iran came out and made the statement that if Israel or, or any foreign power directly attacks Syria, that Iran will, will jump in the fray and go to war. Okay, now... Uh, yeah, also yesterday, the so-called rebel forces, which are really foreign mercenaries, uh, right. the, the rebel forces announced that they had confirmed that Syria was taking their uh, warheads of uh, mass destruction, their chemical warheads and their biological warheads, and deploying them to forward air bases near the border with Israel, and uh, was, prepare, was preparing to strike at Israel. Now, keep in mind that tonight is the uh, date uh, that many times Israel has been struck at very, very heavily in its history, in its ancient right. biblical history. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but anyway, be, beyond uh, You're that, talking about Tishbiav, right? Yeah, right, right. Yeah. I believe that starts, what, tonight? Yeah, I think so, Tishbiav, yeah. yeah, which okay. is basically now, starts the gaze of awe, which I think are last three weeks. Right, okay, now... Yeah. Uh, yesterday, and, 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 and let me let me read the uh, uh, the first paragraph here. The strangest of, the, of events took place uh, today. This was yesterday, late yesterday, in Israel. The senior serving military officer, IDF chief of staff, Lieutenant General Benny Gantz, and the head of the political and security division of the Israeli Defense Ministry, Amos Gelad, both publicly challenged the president, the prime minister, and the defense minister on the va uh, the vital issue of Syria weapons of mass destruction. What 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 it was was literally a last-minute successful effort, at least for the time being, to prevent an all-out general Middle East war that is certain, according to senior political and military officials in Russia and China, to become the Third World War. Uh, this was the cover. This was the, the impetus for a immediate Israeli attack on Syria. Well, what happened is the Israeli defense forces joined, the leadership joined, 
all these far, uh, these retired uh, Mossad chiefs and, uh, and, 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 and intelligence chiefs, military intelligence chiefs, Seth Ben chiefs, who have been saying that uh, Netanyahu is basically nuts. This drive to war with Syria and Iran will get Israel destroyed. And the IDF threw on the brakes at the last minute. And I'm mean really, literally at the last minute. Yeah, we're literally at the point where World War III could have started today. It, we would already have been in it right now. Yeah, already in it. Okay, so now we want to hear from Dr. Bob because you've been wrote this book, which has had remarkable success, The, the Secret Sect. The website is thesecretsectsect.com. Uh, Dr. Bob, we keep on updating it, and you've written some other documents. You send people that order the book that gives us a number of points that have actually been fulfilled now since the book has been put out. Uh, these two big issues, we've got the huge drought going on, which I think is tied to the Macondo drilling site at British Petroleum. is probably the major factor, although there's galactic and other uh, cyclical factors as we head into an ice age. We have on top of that the spiritual side of this, which means it's judgment against America. And then we have the issue of the West, including Hillary Clinton and the Obama administration backing NATO and the United Nations to start a conflict in the Middle East that could cause a conflagration to cut off the Strait of Hormuz and start a World War III with pulling Russia and China in like the ancient hooks in the jaws of the ancient empires, pulling them into a conflict that will become a world war. Uh, this is not a joke, and it could be stuttered by a period of peace or false peace treaties, but all the players and all these things have been coming together now for many years, and it looks like they're finally getting to the point where they're getting trigger happy. Well, you know, uh, thanks for having me on. You've had me on quite a few times, uh, and it was interesting. The first few times I was on, there were less of world events that lined up with the predictions in the 2012 and the Rise of Secret Sec book. Now there's even more. Regarding the Middle East, there's two or three things going on that are definitely relevant right now. Uh, one is, uh, as your uh, your other guest was saying, there's, a, there's truly a lot happening in relationship to uh, Israel, Syria, and Iran. And just to, to let your listeners know this, uh, biblically, I don't see Iran has a shot right now to, to, to be highly successful. They may hurt us, they may hurt Israel, but they're not going to be the biblical king of the south. They might support it, but they're not going to be in charge like they want it to be. Because of that, I've been convinced for the longest time that Syria is going to have to, the regime has to change. Either Assad is going to change his mind, not likely, but possible. Uh, he's going to be gone, or something's going to happen, because I'm of the uh, ilk that Syria will be, Syria, at least Damascus, Syria, is going to be destroyed. Now, today in the news, uh, Israel went out and said that if the opposition forces in Syria actually take over the chemical or biological weapons, that the foreign minister of Israel today said that's a red line and Israel would attack. And one of the generals has said, well, maybe not. And then must have been, I don't know, maybe a half hour later, uh, Ehud uh, Barak, who is a former prime minister and a current defense minister of Israel, told the world, oh, by the way, if we preemptively attack Iran, that's way better than having nuclear weapons. And as you guys have both indicated, uh, Iran and Syria are pretty well locked at the hip. Uh, I've, right, I've been saying and for a long they're locked in the hip also with Russia and China, too. There's no well, doubt yeah, that Pakistan's China, already said... I'm going to totally stick their necks out if, if, if it's well, Pakistan will, though. With, with Syria. Well, they, they've got well, a limit. They, they don't want well, Syria to get overthrown. I'm not, I agree with yeah, you. Yeah, but I think the real wild card in this is Pakistan. Pakistan is the third largest manufacturer of new nuclear warheads on the planet with their new plutonium uh, enrichment facility. They can generate between 60 and 120 new large yield nuclear weapons over 150 to 200 kilo, uh, kilotons uh, each uh, or more. Every year, bit, so at least that, fifty a year from just one plant, and, it, and right. it's only part of their operation. Right. Yeah, but, and the but, fact but is that much Pakistan is tied there. in for either themselves or for the Saudis. So right now, I don't think they're going to want to support Iran. I mean, they might take oh, money from Iran will. because they can no, they've already made a they've already made a public statement. They're going to uh, they they may have had funding from Saudi Arabia, but uh, the the Pakistanis are are geopolitically tied directly to Iran. There's no way that Iran can fall without Pakistan being well, under the ground. Because downwind. They're also downwind. And here's the other thing is the Iran knows, uh, Pakistan knows that the West wants to dismantle into different provinces Pakistan, and they want the Waziristani nukes in that plant. The ultimate goal is that once they take Syria, then it's Iran, and then it's Pakistan. So Pakistan knows it's third in line. If Syria falls, it's down the road. 
Welcome back, and uh, we have Dr. Bob Teal. You've done a, besides being a, a great wellness doctor, we want to get you back on talking about that as well in another show. But uh, Ahmadinejad and the uh, Sunni Shiite have different versions of their, quote, prophecy about the Mahdi, the uh, Imam Mahdi, which is interesting because it sounds like a lot of the terms you see from the Hollywood movie put out about 30 years ago called Dune, uh, where the... Uh, the Arrakis, uh, the you know, planet, uh, which is sandy, which is very much like Saudi Arabia, is needing water, et cetera. It's always the opposite of what we have. You know, and all the water is underground, in a sense, just like the oil. What we have uh, a situation is that, uh, and this is my suspicion, is it's only a matter of time before the Syrian regime falls. And the only thing that will hold that back from a nuclear war is a peace treaty, which means a false peace treaty and the partitioning of the state of Israel is at the doors. Uh, because uh, otherwise, if there's a physical attack on Iran, Iran has missiles that can strike anywhere in Europe and has advanced uh, uh, fuel air and solid fuel rocket missiles and biological weapons from the biopreparat program. Uh, this will be Armageddon. Uh, the, the the regime change, though, is going to foment a future war because Sunni and Shiite will be the, if you want to call it, the driving force for the war of Armageddon because it will eventually pull in China and Russia. And even if there's a false treaty for a period of time, it can't hold back the forces that will eventually release the battle of Armageddon in the Middle East with the mother load of all the oil. For example, we see now the rise of the Kurds in the north now ready to separate and have a separate country from, from even the Iraqi government. The Kurds are basically finally powerful enough and they're also energizing the, uh, the Marxist uh, Kurds in eastern Turkey, which is why the Turks are so determined to get involved in Iraq because they know that a good chunk of their eastern side of their country could be annexed by northern Iraq. Uh, and he knew Kurdistan rising up with the oil power it's eight times more oil than Saudi Arabia so th this situation is very very interesting well, well getting back to some of the others and um, you, you, you by the way you used the term Armageddon two or three times I think you only meant it once <laughs> yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah well, no we're marching toward it I'm just back, saying there's very bad what's going on with Syria and what's going yeah. on in prophecy yeah what, what's um, happening is we're marching toward it in various battles and we may have a certain level of destruction but the final right. battles are and, yet and future that's what, and that's that's consistent you know, uh, biblical prophecy talks about the rise of a, a confederation that includes Egypt and North African and Middle Eastern countries uh, known as the King of the South. Um, and right now you've got the situation where the Shiite Muslims, uh, basically uh, Iran, uh, and there's a bunch of Shiites in Iraq, of course, and some other places, have a lot of influence with Syria. So Syria right now and Iran are pretty much locked together. And if one goes, the other is probably going to go, and they're, they're, going to, they're going to try to work together. Now, Israel, uh, in my opinion, has underestimated the uh, potential damage or if they fight either Syria or uh, Iran. I think the United States has underestimated the potential damage as well. But getting past that, Syria is destined to support this coming king of the south. And so either uh, the President Assad is going to change his attitude, not likely, but it's possible, I suppose. Uh, he's going to be removed, pretty likely. Uh, and what, what rises up in Syria will also support this concept that's rising throughout the, uh, the Middle East and North Africa, and that's to support a group like the Muslim Brotherhood, who's trying, its stated goal, by the way, is to have a caliphate, which is an Islamic confederation. Now, they actually claim they want to have one from Spain to Indonesia. Now, they're not going to get Spain, no. uh, but they might get Morocco, and they might get as far as Afghanistan, or at least uh, to Oman in the... Uh, Absolutely. In, the, in fact, the, the, the I, peninsula. I, I, I want to make a statement. I don't think that it's possible to have a peace treaty until the Assad regime falls. It's, it's, you, and you're, it's, you're probably correct on that. The, the peace treaty that you're referring to, for your listeners, would be the one in Daniel 9.27. And typically, peace de deals don't, treaties don't happen just because people want to have peace. Normally they happen because somebody's getting blown away or has been... Or, they, or they're trying to avoid so much, a nuclear war. They feel they have a choice but to agree to some kind of a deal. And that's what we may, if something's going to have to trigger that, 
And at this instant, the most likely thing looks like a regional war, which again would probably involve Israel, possibly Lebanon, definitely Syria and Iran, or almost definitely, and likely with U.S. US support. So we're talking about a major conflict, and that could result in this peace deal happening. And with Israel going out and saying, and, and today, that look, if, if the uh, opposition Syria takes over the, new, the chemical and biological weapons, that they've crossed the line and, and Israel's going to attack. At the same time, a couple days ago, uh, Syria says, we have these chemical weapons. By the way, we're not going to use them on our own people, but basically if Israel, the United States, or anybody from the West attacks, we're going to use them. Yeah, it tells me also that the situation it, it, where uh, uh, Syria's yeah. going out and said they'll do it. Now today, Israel goes out and says, "If somebody else gets your weapons, we're going to definitely attack." And then the, the the defense minister, as I mentioned before, goes out and says, "Oh, by the way, if we do a preemptive attack on Iran, that's a good thing. Nobody should fear that." And it's like, okay, so we certainly are hearing the war drums uh, beat pretty strongly. Now, yeah. one view of this, of course, is that. Different groups are posturing. The Iranians really wouldn't support uh, Syria. I would say that I think the Iranians do plan on supporting Syria. The Syrians really wouldn't uh, use their chemical, nuclear, at least biological weapons. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold my breath and say, if I was living over there and say they aren't going to do it. Or Israel won't actually really do a preemptive attack. Well, Israel's done several preemptive attacks. They took out Iraq's uh, nuclear facility years ago. Yeah. They did a preemptive attack. Uh, uh, and destroyed uh, Egypt's uh, air force uh, a few decades ago. Right so, on the <laughs> ground. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And so I, I think that these guy, these leaders from these countries are not just blowing smoke. They no, might be, I, uh, but they're also, if it comes, if push comes to shove, I think every one of them is willing to do what they said. At least on those yeah. parts. Yeah, we know that they're they're probably, and this is my guess, and this is a just calculating these things together. There's probably going to be a regime change, or at least some kind of coalition government, where they'll try to have uh, Kofi Annan, the United Nations, and the Russians and Chinese come on side to say, okay, we're not going to do a regime change. We're not going to force Assad to leave, but he has to share share power with the other side. We're going to have we're probably a lot of United Nations troops brought into Syria uh, to try to maintain a uh, a partition between these two different forces are at each other's throats and what's likely is they're not likely to remove the weapons because eventually it's in the Bible that Damascus will be destroyed which means there has to be some period of time where there has to be some peace where the weapons for Iran, for Syria still exist so Israel is most likely the one that will destroy Damascus so that means we're probably looking down at uh, what we call the barrel of a, of a regional war like as early as next week or this fall we're almost certainly looking at a peace treaty that's going to uh, neutralize Syria and the danger to Israel uh, of of a deal which by the way the, the the waft was controlled by the king of Jordan and the king of Jordan is if you want to call it the template for the king of the south he may not be but he's a template because the king of Jordan and their family uh, he was his he, you know the king of Jordan was a former tank commander in the British military uh, his family are high level uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, it, you know this situation in Jordan is very interesting because it's exactly what the, the British want right from Morocco right through to uh, Afghanistan they want to have a Muslim Masonic Caliphate in control working with the bankers to get their control of the Middle Eastern oil resources and have more puppet regimes and in two years they've accomplished more that would have taken otherwise 20 years so they've done a lot of amazing very evil things we come back with Dr. Bob Teal. We'll discuss this in more detail and try to flesh out where it's going and how fast. Welcome back to the uh, Nutramedical Report. Uh, we have to look at Syria as a completely different thing. It's not 18 different uh, tribal areas. It's one cohesive nation. And even most of the Sunnis that do business know that they're at the same table as the Shiites, uh, Alawites, as well as the Christians. So uh, Bashar Assad, I think, is basically an eye doctor, trained in Britain, worked there. That's where he picked up and married his wife, who is a Syrian as well. And that is westernized. Uh, he wants to neutralize the situation. The Syrian, though, have a 
uh, military that will not tolerate civil war. And I, I saw the actual video clip years ago, you know, many months ago when this whole, uh, quote, civil war started. It was actually external terrorists coming into the country uh, that were killing Syrian citizens and military personnel. Uh, this is not disputable. We had a minister, a Greek Orthodox minister from Chicago, went to Syria and even talked to Assad and talked to senior minister, uh, ministries inside Syria and traveled around the country before things really blew apart. Uh, this is, you know, they pay $75,000 for Saudi Arabian people, you know, militia, to go in and act as terrorists in Syria. I mean, this is an act of war by Saudi Arabia. And, uh, you know, it's said at some point that the, that, uh, Ilam, which is the ancient country of western side of, of Iran, will eventually destroy uh, the burden of the desert of the sea, which is Saudi Arabia. So Saudi, uh, the capital, which is Riyadh, is only 814 air miles from Tehran. And the missiles that the Iranians have are fully capable of wiping out and destroying Tehran. Tehran is playing all kinds of games, and of course through uh, Uma Abedi, Abedin, which is the senior assistant for our Minister of Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, she is a daughter of the founder of the Women's uh, Brotherhood, the Sisterhood, if you want to call it, of the, of the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a Masonic organization founded in Britain allied with the banks. I mean, this is a very nepotistic, evil circle of, of, of deviousness that's going on here. Well, right now, as I said, uh, we've got the situation, uh, and uh, in one of the breaks you talked about this, but I don't think we said this on the air, uh -huh. and that was that we've got the situation going on that the United States has been supporting factions that seem to be part of the Muslim Brotherhood and who want to have a primarily Sunni uh, Muslim uh, caliphate. And yeah. what, what we keep doing is supporting things that look like it's, that they want to make that happen. Yeah, exactly. And what's going on in Syria, they've got, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood is rising up in Syria now. Uh, of course, they did rise up in, in Egypt. They've risen up in Tunisia. They just have a slightly different name, just like they, like, it's called the Freedom Party, I think, in Egypt uh, on election, but it's actually still the Muslim Brotherhood, and it's the Anata Party over there in uh, Tunisia. Then you have, then Libya, which you mentioned. And it's interesting, the West falling all over itself saying, oh, well, they, they would have put a secular government in and not an Islamic government. Well, I read a bunch of the fine details, and the people who got in just said, we were, they said they were Islamists. Okay? They just, it wasn't actually called the Muslim Brotherhood, and the, the primary Muslim Brotherhood group didn't actually get in. or Well, they didn't get in very well. But they still have their influence. So we're seeing a situation rise up that the, the biblical king of the South is going to happen. And as you mentioned in my book earlier, my book 2012 and the Rise of the Secret Sect, in my book, I specifically said not only would this uh, King of the South start to rise up, but the United States, uh, Obama administration, would help enable it. And this is what the U.S. has been oh, doing. Oh, everything. Uh, everything you said actually has happened, which is amazing, because you studied the Bible, you looked at all the geopolitical events, and you've integrated them together with the two witnesses, your intellect and the Bible. And it's all right there. And uh, you just have to use common sense, not even prophecy. You have to use the prophecy of the Bible and common sense. Then when we have the yardstick of prophecy, because we do have that, we know that there's coming. And these are the three great signs. People said, I had a question the other day with uh, Jerry McLaughlin. He says, when do you think this will all happen, Eagle? And I said, look, I said, I don't know, but I can tell you the signs. We know there has to be a false peace treaty after a certain level of consternation and destruction in the Middle East that allows the rebuilding of the Herodian Temple, which is King Herod, rebuilt the Temple of Jerobabel. We know that there has to be a partitioning of the state of Israel, and we know there has to be a blood sacrifice started. Everything else is kind of secondary. There will be probably a certain level of destruction, economic and otherwise, uh, death and destruction, but will frighten people into accepting this peace treaty because they know anything other than this peace treaty means not only regional war between Sunni and Shiite in Israel, which is armed to the teeth with the third largest nuclear armed force in the world, but almost certainly world war. And that means incoming nuclear missiles on every U.S., Canadian, Russian, you know, on every Western city, every Russian city, Chinese city any, of any size being nuked to death. And most people don't realize that Japan is potentially the second nuclear power, not the third or fourth, Japan. And most people don't realize what happened to Fukushima. It's interesting that the Fukushima Daiichi plant is the center of where they brought the Oki Maru, the nuclear material from Russia, and where they're doing plutonium enrichment for nuclear detonators. The fact is Japan has the most advanced missile launch system outside of the United States uh, and Russia 
for launching uh, satellites and can easily snap on warheads. And I'm sure they have occult programs going on in Japan, which I have from my sources have been going on for decades. Completely. Well, but they officially, if you, uh, was it was it was within the last well, it was definitely this month. But very recently, they actually sort of amended one of their either constitution or some law to basically allow for them to have legally, according to their own law, uh, nukes. Right. The reason why on Earthquake Central you'd build nuclear plants in, China, in Japan is for one reason only, so you could fight a future nuclear war, period. It'd be at the back uh, of Russia and Vladivostok, at the back of China, and the growing Asian empire of China and these empires there. So the fact is uh, our great ally there, Japan, after the Second World War, people need to realize this. I've put shows on that Japan and Germany did nuclear testing before the Second World War, before the Manhattan Project. I have the documents, I have material, I even have photos. That Japan was doing things of doing nuclear enrichment. Even the Germans, we doubled our nuclear enrichment materials with the agreement of Operation Paperclip and brought over 100,000 scientists and technicians to America. So places like in San Diego, Coronado Bay, you can go down to the facilities there, and even the buildings are shaped into swastika. You have to understand that America swallowed the scientists and the technology and took all the nuclear materials that were being enriched because they did detonate in the Black Forest in the Baltic Sea. They detonated a plutonium nuclear weapon, and the, and, the, and the Germans didn't launch the V-2 rockets, which they did have nukes. They didn't launch them for God knows what reason, but God prevented it from happening. Otherwise, you could have not just had V-2 rockets, but V-2 rockets with nuclear warheads on them raining down on London at the end of the Second World War, because Germany did have nukes. Well, you know, the, uh, a lot of the scientists who came over to help the U.S. prepare their nuclear weapons... <laughs> Of course, we're Germans. They were collaborating. I, I, talk, I talked to a, in fact, I gave some documents to Jeff Renzi just recently, one of the people that's been writing on this recently, and I'm going to try to get a hold of this gentleman who was a broadcast engineer uh, up in a northern state, and his father was actually the developer of the Krytron switches and, uh, and the project before Einstein and uh, Edward Teller were involved in the project with, with the government. We were working and doing testing of plutonium weapons uh, detonations in the at Bikini Atoll in the South Pacific. And those old blue plutonium atoll detonated bombs are so radioactive, you can't visit that atoll right now unless you wear a full body radiation suit. It's that radioactive since the 1940s. You can't even walk around on the beach. Interesting, eh? Yes. Very interesting. People don't know these facts. They don't realize that we collaborated on the development of the nuclear weapons with Germany and Japan. Bizarre, isn't it? Oh, that's something more of uh, your expertise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it, it shows how evil things are and how twisted it is and, and strange alliances and, and, and enemies because America almost went the other way in becoming an ally of Germany during the Second World War. Yeah, we were trying. We we tried to be neutral for a while. And, uh, well, Lindbergh was doing his very best to try to see if he could swing America behind the Nazis instead of going toward uh, Britain and the Europeans. Interesting, isn't it? Now let, let's get back to this issue about the drought. This is a really another big issue. Uh, what do you see is going on with this drought? Because I think it's tied directly to two major issues: the cutting off of the loop current, which Dr. Zangari from the Frascati Institute, and uh, the coming ice age, which we've talked about on every Friday with our panel, but I believe on the spiritual level, it's judgment on America. We have a false prophet type president, we have an apostate nation, and we have judgment on this, the United States of America, as we head to an election with two demonic candidates for president. We'll be back in a moment. Come back and um, to start off this segment, I just want to make a quote. Uh, that hopefully, you'll remember it because I'll repeat it in the future. Is you control nations with oil and people with food. And of course, you have a lot of quotes in 2012 and the rise of the secret sect. If they want to call the place in order, besides the website thesecretsect.com, then you go to 805 489. 7185 805-489-7185. Go through some of the quotes that you have regarding the, the drought, because this is a very big deal. It's expected to go on to October. There's already quotes on, on what this will mean. Tell us all about it. 
All right, back in, 19, in 2009, in my book, 2012, and the Rise of the Secret Sect, I said the following was about to happen. I said we're going to have odd weather patterns that will result in food shortages and natural disasters, that the world's in a berserk transition, and it, it uh, is the beginning of sorrows. Now, for those of your listeners who follow the Bible, I was quoting Matthew 24, 7 and Matthew 24, 8. Right. And, so, and what's happened... Uh, those are very good quotes, aren't the they? Drought, very, very appropriate quotes. I oh, mean, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I, I like how you do this intellectually. You, you went right through the, this article you wrote. It's just so right to the point, and it goes right to the Bible quotes. You say, well, that's not disputable. It's right there. And that's not, by the way, those words in Matthew 24 are words of Yeshua HaMashiach, God himself, is Jesus incarnate. And so what we've seen, for example, back in uh, uh, 2011, it was reported that uh, we had more extreme weather events in the United States, and we had them in all 50 states, by the way, so, and that was one thing. Then this year, they've been saying that the uh, 2012 drought is, was declared the U.S.'s largest ever natural disaster. Now, while at this instant it may not be, because you saw the Dust Bowl and all that kind of stuff, it, the longer this keeps up, this can be a big problem. And one of the things you and I were talking about over off the air was it's not just in the United States. They got a problem in Russia. They have they they have delayed monsoons over in India, and that's damaging their crops. And even over in Europe, they've got uh, uh, a drought situation. They have a heat wave there, and it's looking like it's going to reduce like 16 percent of their global exports or whatever, uh, or the world's global exports in terms of uh, uh, grain. Uh, we've had corn prices uh, that a few weeks ago had risen 33%, and I haven't checked the, you know, I don't follow well, it that is, closely. So it's probably up even more since then. Yeah, I think it'll soon be hitting 50% this week. What's likely to happen is that we are literally at the end of the seven fat years, and we're now entering the seven lean years, which also tells me, like the prophecy of Joseph, remember how the Bible, one of the principles is there's a four... Uh, the reason why the Bible is written in this parable is a duality rule is that things have an ancient prophetic fulfillment and a modern one. So the prophecy of Joseph, the prophecy of Joseph, and I remember the descendants of Joseph is Ephraim, I call America Ephraim America. America is or was a republic, which is the only government that's, that's acceptable to God. No king but the rule of God over the land, which is the spiritual rule, and we've broken that covenant. And America right now is in a state of impending and ongoing and fulfilling judgment. Not good. This is a not good situation to be. Right. I, I God, believe that the, the drought or supposed to, or wake up call for the people here. Oh yeah. And you know, America is the world's largest export exporter of corn, wheat, and soybeans. And prices for those commodities already surged to record levels, according to a report that I saw today that came out. Um, the U.S. itself is somewhat insulated from uh, from some of the price increases for a while because, again, we export, so we still have those. We have so much our production. Come but in this country, we're going to see some major increases. Uh, I know everybody likes to think, I, I shouldn't say likes, but tends to think, okay, well, food shortages, that's going to affect these people in Africa and maybe some people in India and all that kind of stuff. But in the U.S., we're never going to be affected. Well, our extreme reliance on things like GMO corn, GMO soybeans, some so-called modern uh, agricultural practices, Mon monoculture, is a greater risk, greater risk than what happened in in in, old, in ancient times. Exactly, and we also, by the way, don't have a lot of food storage. I think back to the mid '80s, we had. By statutory regulation, we had, I think, up to two years in storage of dried food and grain, et cetera, in America. We don't have that anymore. I think yeah. the average uh, person has in their home three days of food. The average city has up to maybe a week of food that's stored somewhere in warehouses going to grocery stores. Within three to four weeks after a famine, people would be starving and we would see raids on homes to try to get food. We would see horrendous things happening. And at the end of, and this is what I was told by military experts in Canada, the United States, and Australia, at the end of six months, if the, just the power went out, we're not talking about a plague or a war or anything, just the power went out and there was no food transportation, nothing, no vehicles moving, 90% of the population in the Western world would be dead and cannibalism would be the standard process by which people are fed besides foraging. Well, we were talking pets. about, for example, uh, the U.S., uh, Israel, Iran, and Syria uh, toward the beginning of this hour. You know, Iran has EMP weapons. Oh, yeah. And with, for your listeners, uh, electronic, electromagnetic pulse weapons. 
if they're launched and they release on the right area, they can technically wipe out U.S. electricity. And my book well, talks about that happening from possibly a solar flare or other sources. Now, they also have their cyber they, warfare team, by the way. They're not as active as the Blue Army in Tianjin, China. But believe me, the, the Iranians know that cyber warfare against infrastructure and power networks, etc., is part of warfare. Also, the realize of lyophilized biological agents. They don't need to send a, a drone. They can simply have a spray bottle in the back of a refrigerator in Chicago, Atlanta, Los Angeles, and then go out for a walk and spray it out the window of a bus, a train, or a subway, and you have an infected population that are dropping like flies. Well, Americans may find this hard to believe, but Muammar Gaddafi thought he could outlast the U.S. military, but the Iranians have gone to the point where they've said that their their leader, the Imam Mahdi, which will probably not be the true king of the South, the one they're talking about, they say he's always around, alive. They say that he has orchestrated the Arab Spring. They say that he is on their side, and so the infidels of the U.S. and Israel are going to fall. Now, they, they believe in this guy, but they also apparently believe in having technology to try to do something like these EMP weapons. Right. And, you know, we, we're, we're really in a kind of a chaotic year here. Uh, just for your listeners who haven't read my book, 2012 and the Rise of the Secret Sect, I want to make it clear. I do not believe it's possible that the world will end in 2012, and my no. book is very clear about that. But yeah, my book exactly. also says, look, just because the world doesn't end this year doesn't mean we're not going to be in a berserk transition. It doesn't yeah, mean we won't have chaos. It doesn't. matter of fact, we will probably see food shortages and natural disasters and odd weather patterns, and certainly we're seeing all those right now. Yeah, in other words, the uh, chaos will be bumped up a big bunch of notches this year. And I would say... This is the beginning of sorrows. In other words, things are going to get real ugly, which is part of the reason why, in fact, we're going to be pushed to the brink that it says, I shall annul your covenant with death. It says in Isaiah, which is the peace treaty that will be soon signed in Israel. That peace treaty is coming from a, from a time of such danger and consternation that they will choose a toxic peace treaty uh, that they know can't work for one seven. And again, this has, t- it has biblical and historical facts that they'll do it for a period of time and that's what they're planning on doing, is signing a peace treaty for one seven or seven year period of time in biblical uh, Hebrew calendar year. Well, we're getting back to some of the biblical points you were referring to. I agree that I believe that we are in the biblical time called the beginning of sorrows. A lot of people confuse that in the Great Tribulation, but the beginning of sorrows begins starts first. Right. And as you alluded to earlier, you know, since my book came out a few years ago, world events have already confirmed at least 23 predictions in the book. And for your listeners who don't have it, they, if they have a pencil, they might want to write this down. Because most of the predictions that are in the book actually happen after 2012, as you know. Yeah, I know you did. A, you did a very good job of this, and you, and you, you delineated this very carefully. We're dealing with the time of sorrows. I don't know when the tribulation starts, but I can tell you the signs are a peace treaty, partitioning the state of Israel, and the blood sacrifice with the Herodian temple. Period. We're, we're it's those three. Of, we're and, and that has to happen. Up. And by the way, that can only happen on the day of Sukkot or the Feast of Tabernacles. And exactly seven years to the day after that is the Feast of Yom Teruah, or the Feast of the Blowing of Trumpets. It's called a long trumpet. So, and in the middle of that, exactly to the day, is the uh, the uh, 2520th day. In the middle of that seven-year period is Pesha, and 30 days before is Yom Kippur. The, you know, they, they talk about the the the, uh, the day when the Hamadasha cookies are made, because remember Haman trying to kill all the Jews off, and the blood sacrifice will be cut off. That template means whenever it starts. You can watch the signs, as it says, and there will be no dispute as to what it is. I don't know when it starts, but I can tell you, with your book, with the revelations, it says, close up and seal the words of this book until the time of the end. And your work, Dr. Bob Teal, and other witnesses coming forward now, is telling us we're in the time of sorrows. We're very close to the actual biblical tribulation, where the state of Israel is partitioned, the blood sacrifice starts, and a false peace treaty is confirmed with the king of the south involved. It's coming, isn't it? Uh, things are coming. Amazing. The phone number again to call to order is 805-489-7185, thesecretsect.com. Coming back tomorrow, we have Dave Snugs, myneighborinneed.com, a way to help your neighbors. And uh, major updates with Tim Alexander and Chris Harris. You don't want to miss tomorrow's show. Back tomorrow. Back tomorrow.